Welcome, everybody. Tonight we have Dr. Jackie Augustine talking to us about the adaptations that birds have for flying. Jackie Augustine joined Audubon of Kansas in January 2021 as executive director. She received her degree at Kansas State University studying the behavior of greater prairie chickens. As an associate professor in biology at The Ohio State University, she expanded her research to cover both lesser and greater prairie chickens in western Kansas, since we're um, glad to have both species here in the state. Audubon of Kansas is a nonprofit environmental organization dedicated to advocacy, conservation, and environmental education in Kansas, Nebraska, and the Central Great Plains. As executive director, Jackie works with public officials to advance environmental issues and manages Audubon of Kansas's three sanctuaries, including a 5,000 acre ranch in northern Nebraska. So welcome, Jackie. I tend to walk around, so I will hold the microphone. Thanks everybody for coming and thank you for that introduction. And this is a great uh, program that I love giving because it brings me back to my academic days where I get to teach people about the anatomy of, of different organisms. But it's even better because there's no test at the end that I have to grade. So um, we just get to sit back and enjoy this information. Um, and so birds built for flight, I'm going to go through all the different adaptations that birds have in order to fly. And it is really remarkable that everything about their physical bodies has something to do with their ability for flight. There we go. So what is required for flight? Well, anything that flies has to uh, fight or use or utilize these three forces that act upon a flying thing. Of course, we think about flight and lift, that those two are kind of synonymous, that, that flight has to involve lifting off the ground in some manner. But flight, a lot of flight also involves thrust, the power to fuel that flight. And those two forces are acting um, against drag, which is pulling down the organism or the, the vehicle um, backwards, and then weight, which is pulling down. And so when I think about what is required for flight in a bird, it's all these forces. So maximizing lift and thrust, but minimizing weight and drag. And so, Looking at our themes of flight, lightweight, right? So that is lift, power, or thrust. Wings also provide the lift. And so I guess, I guess lightweight is counteracting weight or gravity. And then aerodynamics is min minimizing that drag. So the first thing about being lightweight is the feathers. And you can think that you know, the wings themselves, having the construction of a wing, how do you make it and still be lightweight? And I think the feather itself is so miraculous because it's complicated, yet it's strong, yet it's flexible, yet it's repairable, you know? So it has all these qualities of being lightweight. Um, you know a feather has the central shaft and then you have the barbs coming off of that and then the barbules coming off of that. And I'm sure you've um, all encountered a feather in the field and maybe it was a little bit beat up when you found it, that there were some of the veins were apart. And all you have to do is run your finger along that feather to get those barbs and barbules hooked back up to repair that feather. And having this structure that's so complicated yet so simple and so lightweight is really one of the things that makes flight possible in birds, and it defines what a bird is. Um, so our definition of what is a bird, up until we discovered some dinosaurs with feathers, you know, that we look at modern animals, if it has a feather, it's a bird. You don't need any other characteristics, really. If it has a feather, it's a bird. And those feathers, again, are so important for making it lightweight. 
The other thing that birds have is hollow bones. And by hollow bones, I don't mean that there's actually empty spaces in the middle of the bones. Of course, there's cells that will build bone material. There's cells that make other blood cells for you know, the bone marrow. But if you look at the calcium deposits, and so on this slide, the tan or cream or white um, areas, that is calcified bone. And the bottom one is a mammal bone, and the top one is a bird bone. So if you look at a mammal bone, you'll see that there's these large areas of calcium deposits. Whereas in a bird bone, those calciums are deposited not you know, all over the center of the bone, but in very specific areas where there's more stress on the bone. And so they put the support exactly where the support is needed. And so the two bones are about equally as strong, but one is much lighter than the other. In fact, it was funny, one time I was walking with a naturalist in the field and he picked up a bone and he was feeling it and he's like, well, I, I think this is a mammal bone and maybe a raccoon or something and I gave it to me and it was like, oh yeah, it's way too heavy to be a bird bone. And he laughed because he, he didn't, you know, he was using outside characteristics to try and identify it. And I just looked at him like, oh yeah, this is way too heavy. And so the, they are remarkably light for the same size, but also very strong. Um, and this works very well for flying. Um, it doesn't work very well if they are, get injured. And so um, if you ever find an injured bird and it has an injured wing, um, usually those bones tend to shatter when it hits a car or hits a vehicle. And it, um, even if you take it to a veterinarian, they can't just, you know, line them up because they tend to shatter. And so that's why you find um, birds in, in rehabilitation places with maybe bum wings that look very funny. And it's not because they had a bad veterinarian that couldn't line up the bones right. It's, it's because the bones actually shatter when they get hit. But anyway, this quality makes them very light. Birds also have fused bones, and so there's fewer bones in the bird's body than, say, a typical mammal. And so you can look at the structures here. Um, of course, we have two clavicles or collarbones, one on the left, one on the right. Birds have one structure that's fused together, and given that Thanksgiving is coming up, that's the wishbone. Um, so that's a fused bone. Um, they also have fused bones in their hands. Um, if you just look at your hand and you think about how many bones are in there, you know, there's a carpal bone for each, going to each digit and then each digit has three bones. You know, there's a lot of bones in your hand. We look at a bird um, hand and you can see there's two bones, which are the carpals, but then that um, arrow is pointing to the fused bones. And so um, there's a, a fused bone there and then there's only two fingers, if you will. And then finally, the pelvis. The pelvis, um, it, you know, if you think about mammal, mammalian pelvises, there's lots of bones. They're very rigid. They're very, um, you know, substantial things. And if you look at a bird pelvis, they're very light, very thin, very fragile. Um, fused together to minimize, again, minimize weight um, and have fewer bones. And then, of course, there's some missing. I already mentioned the phalanges. Um, you know, in our leg, we have um, two bones on the lower part of our leg. Birds do not. They have a tarso uh, metatarsus, so that um, it's actually a tibiotarsus, where the, the bone um, has just one bone there. And there's a little vestige of a second bone, but they're pretty much fused together. So they only have one bone below their femur. And then, uh, the pygostyle or pygostyle is that bone at the end of the tail. Um, of course, you know, most reptiles have very long tails with many bones and birds have very short tails with fewer bones and that last bone is a little bit more substantial because that's where all the tail feathers are attached. And so you can see the outline of the tail of this bird and there's not bones doing it, all that control of it, and it's kind of imagined that all that control of that tail is on that one little bone, the, the pigeon style at the end of the tail, controls all those tail feathers. And then excretion, and you might be like, excretion? Well, yeah, I guess when you excrete waste that you, you lose weight, right? 
but it actually goes beyond that. Um, the, the, it's interesting because if we look at the different um, chemicals that are used for excretion. So fish use ammonia. So the byproduct of many metabolic processes is ammonia. Ammonia is extremely toxic. And so you need to get it out of your system quickly and it requires large amounts of water to get out of your system. If you're a fish, that's not a problem, right? You live in water, you can just use that water to flush out your system constantly. If you're a mammal on land, maybe water's a little bit more of an issue. And so mammals and frogs, they convert ammonia to urea. And you can see the chemical structure is more complicated. And so there is you know, multiple chemical steps in there. And those chemical steps do take energy. So there must be a benefit if your body is spending energy to, to change it. And, and the benefit is that it's less toxic and it requires less water to get rid of. So you can concentrate it more. But then if you look at urea and you can convert it to uric acid, and look at, again, the multiplication and complexity of structure for that. That means, again, there's a lot of metabolic energy that's being put into that process. And so there has to be a benefit. Why spend the energy if there isn't a benefit? Well, uric acid actually precipitates out of solution, which means that it comes out of solution and becomes a solid. And so when you see bird poop on your vehicle, the white part is the uric acid. And it takes relatively little water to excrete it because it's <laughs> solid, right? Um, and so the benefit is that birds do not have to carry a lot of water in their bodies. Um, and so they don't have to constantly be drinking water. They don't have to you know, carry that water around. And they can get rid of it very efficiently, very concentrated fashion. And you know, besides having uric acid, you know that birds poop frequently. And again, that's also another method for reducing weight. And so, uh, and I guess I should just mention, I'm sure the other component of bird poop you've seen on your vehicle is the little black dots in the bird poop. Well, that's from the digestive system. So that's digested material. Whereas with excretion, we're talking about metabolic waste. So, um, you know, your, your pee, your urine, that kind of thing. Okay, and then reproduction. Um, there's a lot about reproduction that surrounds this idea of being lightweight. And just laying eggs and taking care of offspring outside of your body is one way you can still maintain flight um, without carrying around that extra burden. And, and sometimes this extra burden is extreme. Um, this, you can see the outline of an egg inside the body of this bird. Of course, this is very extreme and this happens to be a flightless bird, um, the kiwi. But it's still the same idea. Even if you're not a kiwi and making huge eggs, if you're say my favorite bird, the prairie chicken, and you're making 12 eggs. Imagine if you're trying to carry around 12 eggs during 23 days that it takes to incubate them. That would be a lot of weight that you'd be carrying around for a long period of time. And so just laying eggs, taking care of them outside your body, you can take care of them, you can go fly, eat, eat food, come back, take care of the eggs. Um, you still maintain your flight abilities. And so, that aspect of reproduction is also very important for birds. All birds lay eggs, even the flightless birds, um, so uh, to reduce weight. Now, that kind of makes sense, but the organs themselves change size during the reproductive season. Um, and so, um, and the structure of them is different between males and females. So you can see males at the top, we have two testes. The testes are inside the body of a bird. They're not external like they are in most mammals. Um, but there's two testes. But if you look at the female, there's only one ovary. And it's always on the left-hand side of the bird. And so, again, this is very efficient. You only have to have the structures on one side. And you're not putting energy and weight 
to having a duplicate set of structures on the left and right. So females only have one ovary, one oviduct, one uterus, always on the left-hand side. And again, not on the right-hand side, presumably to reduce the weight. And then I started saying that the size of these things change drastically. So this is a male, and you can see the breeding one is on the left-hand side, and the non-breeding one is on the right-hand side. So the size of the testes actually change, you know, you know, up to like 10 times, um, depending on whether they're breeding or non-breeding. And again, this makes sense. Why have a structure in your body if you're not using it? So they only enlarge it when it's breeding. And same with uh, the female reproductive tract. We have breeding on the left and non-breeding on the right, and you can see the size of all the different components, the ovary, the oviduct, the uterus, all change in size between the breeding and non-breeding. And I was trying to find, there, it can even be more dramatic than this, because if you think about when they're actually making eggs, they usually have multiple eggs in the tract at one time. So, you know, one's getting fertilized, one's getting the yolk added, one's getting the, the shell added. And so there's multiples in that reproductive tract and then um, they lay one a day, you know, one egg a day most often. And so when that active egg laying process is happening, it can be quite large and quite physically demanding for females. And so again, when you're not doing that, you reduce the size of those organs. So I think being lightweight and being a bird, it kind of goes hand in hand, you know, light as a feather and all these things. But I think um, we can't stop there. We have to think about the other components of flight. So we, we talked a lot about reducing weight. Now we're gonna talk about thrust or power. The things that power flight in a bird, the engine of a bird, is the outermost feathers, the primary feathers, the outermost flight feathers on the wing. And so you might think, okay, well, if it's the outermost feathers, well, then the muscles on the wing must be doing most of the heavy work. But in fact, if you look at the size of those muscles on the wing, they're fairly small. The biggest muscles in the body of a bird are those muscles on the breast, the breast muscles. And those are the ones that are responsible for the flap because birds are not flapping the flight, you know, the primaries on the end, they're flapping their whole wing to get that flight. And you think about it, so that whole wing has to flap. That's a big structure and there has to be lots of powerful muscles that move that structure. And so the downstroke of the wing, and if you think about your body, it's this muscle that's connecting from your shoulder to the middle, is the downstroke, and it's actually the same muscle that's on us, that's on birds, the pectoralis. And so you can see in this picture on the left, that big muscle, the pectoralis muscle, is responsible for the downstroke. And obviously the downstroke has to be powerful, right? Because you're trying to push off the ground, push into the air. But if you are taking <coughs> off from a standstill, you also have to have a powerful upstroke, right? You can't just lazily put your wing up and then push down really hard again, right? If you're at a standstill and you jump really hard, you have a strong downstroke, but you also have to have a powerful upstroke so you can come down again. And so that powerful upstroke is a very interesting muscle. It is the supracoracoideus. And so that picture on the right is if you're looking head on at a bird, you know, so if you're looking at a bird head on, you can see the, the keel there that's coming down and the wing coming off to the side. That muscle that's responsible for the upstroke has to attach to the top side of the wing, right? It has to move this top part of the wing. But it comes through a hole between the wing bone and the, the keel, comes through a hole, and it attaches to the inside of the keel. And so again, this is a very strong muscle, a very large muscle, but it has this unique arrangement. So if you're having the um, traditional Thanksgiving feast next week, and you cut into that muscle on the breast, 
And you'll come to a point where you take off some of the, the muscle in the meat, and there's still kind of a separate piece attached below that. That is the supracoracoideus. And it, it's very obvious either when you're making, when you're cutting open a turkey or cutting, or if you're at a chicken and you put your fork into a breast and you pull it out and then there's still some meat that's not attached to the meat that's on your fork, um, that's the supracoracoideus. So again, we have these powerful muscles for the downstroke and the upstroke. And I don't, um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that they're in the middle of the bird's body. Obviously, that's where the wing is, but there, I think it also has a um, weight and balance component too. You know, these are big muscles, and you want to have your weight and balance in flight. You want it sort of in the center of your body, and that's where these big muscles are. You can see the other, you know, the leg muscles are somewhat important. Um, Obviously, if birds are running around on the ground a lot, those muscles are larger, um, but those muscles are also important for that, just a jumping into the air to kind of give a head start for that takeoff flight. And if you have strong and big muscles, you have to have strong points of attachment. A muscle is no good if it's not attached to anything. And so you can see, again, the biggest bone in a bird's body is that heel where the pectoralis and supracoracoideus muscles attach. Um, and again, that's how much energy and space in a bird's body is devoted to flight. It's quite a bit with the size of the heel and the size of those muscles. Okay, so we talked about the engine, right? The engine is the muscles and the bones that actually do the work. Well, you have to fuel that engine, and fueling that engine is the digestive system. And so when birds eat, they have to process it in such a way to get most, you know, very efficient energy out of their food. Um, you'll just notice that um, there's not a lot of birds that eat plant leaves and vegetation. You can think of some notable exceptions like Canada goose. Um, but most birds eat things that are very nutritious. You know, like the kestrel and the owl that were out in the hallway. You know, they eat mammals that are full of protein and nutrients. Think about cardinals, they're eating seeds. 96% um, of land birds feed insects to their babies because they're very nutritious. And so birds start out by fueling that engine with very nutritious food. Um, but then when they get the food, they also process it in a very efficient way to get a lot of energy out of it. Um, the digestive system of birds is quite um, complicated. Uh, the first, if you go from the esophagus, the first thing you encounter is the crop. The crop is, um, is kind of just like a grocery bag to take it home. It just stores the food until it can be digested. Um, this can be very large in some organisms, in, in most of them, um, because think about like the seed eating birds, they go out and they're exposed in the environment while they're eating the seeds and then they, if, once their crop is full, they can sit in a protected area in a bush and digest that food. Um, you know, hawks and owls, they might not get a lot of food at once, but they can ingest it all and then digest it over time. So the crop is just a storage area. Next comes the proventriculus. This is a glandular stomach. It's well developed in hawks and owls that digest the nutrients and then regurgitate the stuff that can't be digested, the bones and the feathers. Um, so it's a glandular stomach. It emits a lot of enzymes that help break down the, the chemicals in whatever it eats. Um, and then the gizzard. The gizzard is for grinding. Um, if you are familiar with gizzards, they're very muscular. Um, most birds also eat rocks that go inside of the gizzard. And so the thick walls of the gizzard help move the rocks around and help grind up the food. And if you think about it, most birds eat their food whole or mostly whole. You know, you, I'm sure you've seen cardinal shell the seeds, but um, most birds are eating their foods whole or mostly whole. They're not, they obviously don't have teeth in their mouth for chewing. And so again, I think this, um, having this gizzard that is a very large muscular thing 
It's located in the center of their body. So again, I think that's for weight and balance to keep the center of gravity in the middle and not with teeth that's kind of at the periphery of their body. Um, intestines are usually not that interesting in birds um, because they eat these high calorie foods. They don't have to have long complicated intestines. Of course, exceptions are like Canada geese that do eat um, grasses and, and, and flowers and leaves and so they have to have longer um, intestines for digesting all that and all longer seagar as well. These are seagar just blind end pouches kind of like our appendix um, but really well developed in most birds. So anyway, digestive system is very complicated again to get most of the energy in order to fuel <coughs> this motor. Um, and I think we spend a lot of time because I think in second grade they teach kids about different beak shapes and how these beak shapes are related to the food they eat. Um, but beaks are really just a method for obtaining food and it's not, a, not usually a method for processing food except for falcons that have that hook to tear apart flesh, you know. But um, I think again, most beaks are pretty lightweight they're at the edge of the body, and so they have to be lightweight to keep the center of gravity close to the middle. Okay, well, you have an engine, you have fuel, but you also need oxygen in order to burn that fuel, right? And the respiratory system of birds is so amazing because it's so complicated. <laughs> um, you know, we think of, oh yeah, lungs, right? Lungs are your respiratory organs. Yes, they have lungs and air sacs in their shoulders and air sacs near their hips and air sac like everywhere. Here is an air sac, there's an air sac, everywhere is an air sac because they have to get that oxygen in in order to fuel this engine. And if we look at the amount of area, the size of the the size of the respiratory organs, so the lungs and the air sacs together, they're huge. And so the blue dots and the blue line shows that given a certain size of organism, birds have, birds are the blue dots, birds have larger lungs than other organisms. And on the bottom is mammals, so they're all the red triangles are different mammals, and the um, green ones there are flying mammals. So even flying mammals like bats do not have as much oxygen or lung capacity as birds do. Birds are very good and even flightless birds, that says ostrich way on the right, even flightless birds have more, uh, more of their bodies devoted to lungs than a mammal at the same size. So and it's not just that they have larger lungs. They also process oxygen in a different way than mammals do. So we take in a breath and then we exhale and it all comes out, right? So in, out, one breath, done. Birds have this remarkable respiratory system where the oxygen actually stays in their body for two breaths and then it's exhaled. And so this is a very schematic uh, representation of a, a bird um, respiratory system. Um, the opening on the left is the nostrils. Um, and then you can see the thing in the middle that kind of looks like a radiator. Those are the lungs. And then the circles on the left and right, the circle on the left is the air sacs that are um, in the shoulder region. And the circles on the right are the air sacs that are in the abdominal region. So, the top one, the first time the bird inhales, it goes from the nostril and then it goes to the air sacs in the abdominal region. So that's inhale. When it exhales, that air goes from the air sacs in the abdominal region to the lungs. Then it inhales again. And then the air that was in the lungs goes to the anterior air sacs, so the air sacs near the shoulders. And then when it exhales, it goes out of the body, obviously through the nostrils. So, so the moral of the story is that the oxygen stays in the body through two inhalations and exhalations. And so 
because it stays in the body longer, the bird gets more of the oxygen that's in the air, gets more of it out of the air. And so they had very efficient ways of getting oxygen out. And so um, if you look at birds versus mammals versus reptiles, they are the best at getting the most oxygen out of the air. And uh, kind of an example I think of this is that think about all the efforts it takes for people to get to the top of Mount Everest, right? You, some people need oxygen packs, so, you know, you have to acclimate as you go up, and that's because the air is so thin at the top of Mount Everest. Well, there's these geese called the bar-headed geese that are not only walking, you know, they are flying over Mount Everest. And so that's like somebody running up Mount Everest, you know, on a marathon as they're migrating over Mount Everest. The oxygen is so thin, but these birds are doing amazing athletic feats in migration as they migrate over. And that thin air, they can still get the oxygen they need with their lung. I just find this truly remarkable, how efficient the respiratory system of birds are. <clears throat> okay, and so given that you need so much power, so much fuel, so much oxygen to fuel flight, you don't want to waste any of that power. And down feathers are really important in keeping the bird insulated and keeping that energy available for flight. So down feathers, as opposed to that feather I showed you earlier, that was a flight feather, down feathers do not have that central, flat, um, central shaft. And they don't have barbs and barbules, so the little parts don't stick together either. They're just basically little flute balls. And this is a great horned owl, and you can see that the, the outer feathers are moved, and look at all that dense down feather underneath. Again, this helps insulate the body, this helps keep the energy in, helps maintain a high metabolic rate I'll talk about in a minute. And so um, this is one of the first steps for keeping the energy available for flight and not losing it to the environment. And then um, a large brain. So flight itself is very complicated, right? You know, um, my husband's a pilot and I look at the stuff he has to know in order to fly an airplane. It's a lot of information about weather patterns and, you know, looking out for obstacles in the sky and making sure your yaw and, you know, all the different um, parts of the plane are all going in the right direction. It's a lot of work. And so when we look at a bird's brain, we'll see that um, parts of it are enlarged, especially the parts that have to do with equilibrium and balance. And so looking at this raven's brain and this monkey's brain, you can see that the cerebellum is larger and the brain stem is larger proportionately um, compared to the monkey's brain, whereas the monkey's has a, a bigger um, frontal lobe. And if we look at you know, what the, those things do, the cerebellum is for balance and coordination. And just imagine how much balance and coordination it takes to fly. Make sure all your wing, you know, your feathers are pointed the right way and if a <coughs> wind gust hits you, you can you know, recover. I, th I look at turkey vultures in the sky and on windy days, they, they seem to just effortlessly like correct themselves when they get hit by a gust of wind. And I wonder how much of that is innate that they don't, you know, consciously think. They're not like, oh, I got blown this way, so I have to move my wing this way. I think it's all kind of connected and, you know, done at the brain stem. It doesn't have to go far into the brain to make those corrections. Brain stem is involuntary responses, um, and you can see, again, those two areas are very large in a bird brain. It doesn't have so much of that frontal lobe because of speech production, it doesn't have um, speech production. They are pretty good problem solvers, but you know, not, probably not as good as the, the monkeys and apes. But you can see um, the very large brain with the structures that are larger for controlling 
the flight. And like I said, high metabolism. Um, birds have a body temperature of about 102 to 109 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, from chemistry, if you have a higher um, metabolic rate, your re chemical reactions in your body are happening faster. And so, again, this is a way for birds to keep the fuel fueling that flight and more efficiently. Um, so down feathers and high metabolism kind of go hand in hand to make sure that um, you have the energy to power the machine. And then finally, um, of course, the oxygen has to get from the lungs to the muscles. And so birds have a very efficient circulatory system. And again, their heart is larger per size of organism, per physical whole body size than the mammals. And you can see the heart kind of in the middle of these structures. And the, the right here's the heart, right there's the heart, um, fairly large for their body size. Okay, so, so far we've talked about minimizing weight, we've talked about thrust, now let's talk about lift for a little bit. So obviously the wings are providing the lift, um, but the structures themselves are very interesting. Um, this is <coughs> the wing of a bird minus all the muscles, and so all you see is the bones and the feathers, and it's cool that the feathers are attached directly to the bone, right? These feathers are very important for flight. They, um, you know, they have to move in unison with the bones and they have to be certainly spaced apart. You can't have a lot of wiggle room between them. You can't, you know, have them accidentally bunched together, right? You, that would be a problem. And so they're all equally spaced. They're all attached to the, um, the primary feathers are attached to the hand bones and the secondary feathers, the ones on the inside part of the wing, are all attached to the ulna. And it's interesting um, when we see birds that, or excuse me, when we find new dinosaurs, it's really, the feathers don't always get fossilized with the dinosaurs. And, but if we can see the ulna, and if they have bumps on the ulna, we know that this was a flighted dinosaur because those flight feathers are attached directly to the bone. Okay, so that, that, and then being birders, I don't really have to talk to you too much about wing shape and knowing that there's different shaped wings for different types of flight. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have a fly catcher with elliptical wings. You know, they're not flying fast, they're not flying long distance, so that elliptical wing is great for maneuverability. They'll sit on a perch, fly out, catch an insect, and come and fly back. The second bird there is a swallow. And swallows, they catch insects in the air, um, and they catch usually lots of small flying insects. And so they are moving through the air through great speeds. And so they have these pointed wings. They're kind of slow and um, close to the body, so they can make fast movements through the air. Then we have the albatross. Albatross is a giant seabird. They have very long wingspans, you know, maybe nine feet in, in length. And they do have points at the end, but um, you can see that the length of the wing is very important. And these birds actually rarely flap. They just kind of open their wings and they take off using the ocean breezes. Um, and then the hawk, the last bird there, has uh, slots in its wings, great for soaring above an area, um, so they can just soar and look for their food. Um, but I have these pictures here just to remind you that not all feathers produce lift and are used in flight. Um, this is a, a tropical bird. I'm not sure what kind of tropical bird, if I know. Jamaican hummingbird. Okay, but um, this is just an example showing that these are tail feathers that are not very efficient in flight. Um, they're for making the male sexy. And so not all feathers are for flight. And here's another example. I think this is the pennant winged nightjar or something. Um, 
obviously these big long feathers on the wings are not helping with flight, but they are making the male sexy. Okay, so we talked about the wings. Um, now we're, we're switching gears, so we're, we're done talking about lift, and the last thing we have to talk about is aerodynamics, reducing drag. And one of the things that um, happens is that we want to make sure that we have a very streamlined body. And to have a streamlined body, you want to make sure that it's kind of rigid, right? It's not going to be wobbling around and, and creating drag. And so to make the body rigid and stable during the flight, we have fused bones in the vertebrae. So the vertebrae of the back of a bird are fused. And um, that bottom arrow is pointing to these interesting little processes on the rib bones. These processes actually extend backward and go to the rib bone behind it. There's muscles and ligaments attached to that to make the rib cage very stable during flight. And you can imagine the stresses that are being put upon it if right below it is that huge keel where that's being contracted, you know, the muscles are contracting and, and causing a lot of um, instability, they have to have that stability right there. So fused vertebrae and processes on the ribs, if they're called hallucinate processes, that keep the body stable during flight. And then the contour feathers. You know, to keep that streamlined shape, you know, kind of skinny at the middle, thick or skinny at the head, uh, thicker in the middle and skinny at the tail are the contour feathers. So every, all the feathers covering the body of a bird, those are called contour feathers. And I remember when I was a kid, I loved drawing lots of different things, horses and birds. And when I drew a bird in flight, I always had these feet sticking out the back. And, and you know, as I grow and look, it, there's no feet on these birds. <laughs> you know, they, they actually pull the feet in and under the contour feathers. So the contour feathers go over the feet and that streamlines the birds so that you don't have drag caused by the feet. So no feet there, but you can see the very streamlined nature of the body um, because of those contour feathers that overlap. And, no bird is more streamlined, I think, than the chimney swift. You can see this kind of, you know, it almost looks like a flying fish or something, very streamlined, um, you know, skinny at the middle, the beginning and the thick, and then skinny at the end. Um, and this bird, I, I like the family name that it belongs to. It's Apodiformes. So um, A means not or without, pod means foot. So it is in the, the family of birds without feet. Obviously, it does have feet, but it flies so much that you almost never see the feet unless you have it in hand. Um, and this is, again, a, a swift flying bird that um, eats insects on the wings, and you can see that the, the wing shape is very, you know, short little um, secondary is very long, primary is great for fast flying and maneuverability. So we talked about the themes of flight, talked about many ways that birds are lightweight, powerful, have very um, different shape wings for different types of flight, and then the aerodynamics. Just gonna finish up with a little bit about Audubon of Kansas. Um, we are a statewide Audubon organization. We are formed by chapters, and we work throughout the state. We have a threefold mission. The first is advocacy, so advancing environmentally friendly legislation. We support wetland conservation um, with uh, different means. Currently, we do have a lawsuit that is suing Quivera National Wildlife Refuge, the federal um, agency, um, that they're not doing enough to ensure that the wetlands has the water it needs to support migrating sandhill and whooping cranes. The whooping cranes are the ones pictured in this photo. Um, we also encourage proper wind energy siting. Obviously, it's important to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but we want to make sure that those wind turbines are put in already disturbed areas. We don't need them in the last um, remaining prairies that we have in the state. And then we support other initiatives to conserve <coughs> mining species. Um, 
prairie dogs, prairie chickens, black-footed ferrets. We all work to um, work with the state agencies to conserve them. Um, the second part of our threefold mission is conservation. Um, this is where we demonstrate that um, people and wildlife can coexist, and not just people, but um, economic development and wildlife can coexist. The Hutton Niobrara Ranch is our 5,000 acre ranch along the banks of the Niobrara River um, in northern Nebraska. It is a working cattle ranch which also supports mountain lion, elk, porcupine, sharp-tailed grouse, greater prairie chicken, and many other species. Active Bird Wildlife Friendly Demonstration Farm is 240 acres. It is a row crop agricultural farm southwest of Lincoln, Kansas but there's also a wonderful riparian forest and grassland buffer strips that support Connie after bird's favorite bird, the bobwhite quail. And then finally, Mount Mitchell Heritage Prairie is 25 acres next to another 100 acres of pristine prairie habitat that is also managed as a public park. So people and wildlife can coexist and we demonstrate that on our sanctuaries. And then finally, we have education programs um, we have two festivals. First is the Celebration of Cranes, which happened two weeks ago or so, um, where we invite people out the first weekend in November, and we have expert guides like Patty and Bob that are out there that um, help show members of the public these wonderful species of whooping cranes and sandhill cranes as they migrate through. We have a prairie chicken festival in mid-April, where we take people out to see both greater and lesser prairie chickens on Lex. Um, last year was the first year we offered this festival and we had 90 people attend from 25 <coughs> different states to Western <coughs> Kansas. A lot of people think, what's out there? But there's, there is lots to see in Western Kansas. We are currently um, putting on a nature adventure backpack program. And so in every library in the state, we're trying to get a backpack with adult and children's binoculars fold out guides for birds and butterflies, and a map of their county showing where there's public lands to view wildlife. We're trying to get this in every library in the state so patrons can check it out and check out the wildlife where they're at. Um, we currently have a chickadee checkoff grant that will get it implemented in Southwest Kansas. We have um, support to get it um, in the Kansas City area, um, but we are gonna hopefully roll it out throughout the state. And then public outreach. So events like this, if you have a, a group you think would benefit from a talk like this, whether it's a Rotary Club or a Boy Scout troop or you know anything, I'd be happy to share this information. And you know, I think we all are concerned about the birds in our areas. And I just always want to make sure that you know that there's some things that you can do to help protect the birds. Um, and especially in Wichita, I know Wichita has um, issues that come up with um, feral cat colonies and trap neuter release programs. All cats have the ability to catch birds and, and bird deaths by cats are very, um, one of the biggest problems in North America. You can try these collars. These are bird safe collars, birds be safe collars. I hear they're good, I'm not really sure. So if you have a neighbor that, um, insists on having a feral cat, you can try and do this collar and, and maybe it works. But the best thing for the cats and for the birds is to keep the cats indoors. Um, you can make windows safer by putting protective films and other barriers so birds don't fly into windows. You can plant native plants. Um, so native birds, uh, or excuse me, native plants feed a whole bunch of different species of native insects. And 96% of land birds feed insects to their chicks. So it's so important to have native plants to supply birds with these insects they need to feed their chicks. Um, you can also leave the leaves. I know that um, your homeowners or association or neighbors might not want the leaves in the grass, but if you can leave them in the flower beds, that's gonna at least provide some um, Overwinter cover uh, many moth species overwinter in the leaf litter. And so if you leave the leaves, you're leaving moths that can be fed to birds later. And then of course, always reduce the herbicides and pesticides. Um, they affect um, not only the target things, but also a lot of off-target things. 
um, that you don't really intend. And so if you can reduce that or eliminate it, that's great. So um, I hope you enjoy the, the presentation about birds and flight and how birds are built for flight. If you're not a member of Audubon of Kansas, of course, I encourage you to do that and then stay informed. And I have this up here. I was going to pass it around so that um, we have a free monthly email newsletter. And so if you want to get that newsletter, please sign up for it. We just need your email address. I think I'll put it. And there's a, a lot of handouts on the back tables. Those are free for the taking. So. Thanks for coming, and I really appreciate your attention. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. I have two questions. OK. Um, one has to do with flight of birds. And the question is, with flight of birds, did they evolve to become flight of birds? So uh, the first uh, part, um, most flightless birds, I'm trying to think if the, the ostriches and the rheas evolved from flighted birds. I know like penguins and um, like the cormorants that are in the Galapagos, those all evolved from flighted birds and they lost their ability to fly. I'm not sure about the ostriches or rheas. Um, but anyway, the ostriches and rheas and kiwis still have hollow bones. Um, they still have the large lungs and the large hearts. They still have um, many, most of the adaptations for flight. They just don't have the wing structure. Yes. The second question I had came from the comparison they don't talk I said they don't have speech patterns I mean obviously I told you a lot of details during this presentation that birds are not able to convey they can convey lots of information like the food is over there and there's a predator over there um, they have dialects so they can learn their song and they can learn dialects but the song they can't do speech patterns like I'm doing now. Right, and, and, uh, but, but some of them can say things. Are they just mimicking? Are they just making noises? They're not actually tying their brain to their tongue and making a speech pattern make any sense? So the one exception is um, like African gray parrots. Um, there was a, a wonderful study with Alex, the African gray, that um, they raised that parrot in a social setting. So there was the researcher, there's this African gray parrot, and then there was another researcher. And so um, they would put out four, you know, blocks and four circles. And, you know, they would say, how many circles? And the researcher would say, three, you know, and, and Alex would learn that if it repeated that word three, and when there was three there, so it could count, and it could have some basic understanding about what's a block and what's a circle. Um, and, but that level of communication that's so detailed um, is learned in the lab. They, um, in the wild, African greys would communicate, or they're very social, they could pick up on cues from other um, organisms, you know, others of their own species, they communicate where like I said, where food is, where predators are. Um, but, you know, they aren't really putting together sentences in the wild. So for the most part, they communicate with each other, they just can't communicate with us. 
Yes, but, but I think the complexity of communication between us where we can describe abstract thoughts and physics and you know, um, that level of communication and thought processing um, does not happen. Any other questions? Yes. A comment. Yes. Um, you mentioned about birds flying as high as ever go. Um, in fact, they are. They will go over from the Chirai area, which is not very high at all. jump, they can go up over Everest and land in, in uh, Tibet. And at one shot, they don't <coughs> have to go up slowly, 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 and take us several days to get to a certain elevation and so on. Absolutely incredible it is. that uh, when you go to Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's not a, a point I emphasize, and that's another another reason why we all love birds, right? Yes, Bob. That you make a hummingbird called Screamer Tail. An apt name for it. <laughs> he said the Jamaican hummingbird that I pictured was a Screamer Tail. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for your attention. Leftover, it's Sean's cake left over from last time, but it was frozen, so it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>